the next five days, we're going to have 10 talks for you. So two a day, 10.30 and 12 um, Eastern time. I don't know what other time zones there are, but I'm told they exist. Um, and so uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have about 50, 55 minutes allocated per talk. And then we're going to have a short discussion during the talks. Um, we ask you to uh, ask questions and participate in discussion if you'd like to. Uh, so feel free to just unmute your microphone, don't do uh, raise hands and things like that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, other than that, other than asking questions, keep your microphones muted. I will also say keep your videos on. It's nicer for the speaker to see a bunch of uh, faces rather than, um, rather than just uh, black screens, although, if you're one of uh, these uh, men that experiment with facial hair during the lockdown, uh, we, we don't need to see you, uh, it's okay. And you totally cannot pull this beard off. Um, okay, and so, uh, yeah, let's just get going. I see that we're recording already. So the first uh, speaker today is also the first speaker of the whole hottest series back from 2018. And it's been great pleasure to introduce a uh, long, time friend uh, and collaborator Peter Lansing, whose title today, I'm not quite sure how to uh, do the intonation on this one, but I guess it should be something like, what are we thinking when we present a type theory? Thank you very much. So, yes, I think that's, that's pretty much the intonation I had in mind. Um, but yes, before, before getting onto the substance, I'd first like to say, of course, thanks very much to the organizers for organizing this so that we all have something fun to keep us occupied during these challenging, troubled, difficult, whatever we're calling them, times. Um, some good, clean homotopy type theory to replace um, all of the nice in-person conferences to sunny places with good wine that we could have been at, but this is nearly as good. Um, so thank you very much indeed to Chris and Dan for organizing this and inviting me. And thank you all for coming, for turning up. And so, and especially thanks to those who've come, even though you may have heard bits of this talk before, because this is work that Andre and Philip and I have had in preparation for about five years and sort of have still not quite managed to write up, but it's very nearly written up. It'll be out any day now. Um, and I've talked about bits of it before, but as ever, this is, I hope, a sufficiently different uh, emphasis and take on it that it won't be too boring for anyone who has heard some bits before. But yes, this is what are we thinking when we present a type theory? With, there's a lot of different intonations you can put on that, and most of them are kind of accurate in what I mean, in that a type theory is a nebulous sort of thing. We've all, um, the, the sort of, the Colvillis talk said um, that familiarity with homotopy type theory is presumed, and so I presume everyone here, uh, almost everyone here has probably seen at least one and probably a fair few type theories presented. And so you're used to reading a set of rules like this. This is the rules for pi types. If you've seen any type theory, it probably had pi types in. So you see these rules and you read them and you say, all right, first one says you've got a type A and then another type B dependent over that one. And when you've got those, then you get a type built out from them called pi. Fair enough. Uh, second one, that's lambda. All right. And so on. And you some author has written a bunch of rules on the page and you read through and you read them and think, what is that saying? All right, I see what it says. That makes sense, I guess. And you go on and at the end you're happy, hopefully. Or you're writing down a type theory and you're the author here. You're sort of figuring out some new rules. You're trying to work out how to present them um, and trying to write down the rules in a way which hopefully will express your intention. Readers will find it reasonable and re readers will sort of accept that what you've written down looks like pretty much like a type theory, looks like the kind of rules that we know how to read them, and when we read them, we know how to understand them, to interpret them. Um, by the way, I see that there are a few messages popping up in chat. Just as a warning, I'm, I'm not following chat. If anyone wants to ask a question to me, then just, I think, un unmute yourself and say so. Interruptions are always welcome. Um, though I may say, Please shut up, I'll leave that to later, depending on the question. Other questions I will say, yes, great question, and answer on the spot. Peter, please stop yep. punching the camera. <laughs> stop your punching the camera. Your hands are much bigger than your face. 
So, sorry, I, I, right, I, I'll try to talk with my hands less, but I, I won't promise to stop entirely. Um, so, right. So we have the rules that are familiar, and then we see unfamiliar rules all the time. We meet new rules. I have come up with some clever new typeformer that um, I want to show to the world, and for it. And so, all right, maybe this is the first rule. We've got some type p dependent over um, a natural, some variable of natural numbers, and then it, in that setting, when you've got that, then you get a type formed out. And I think if you read this rule, you sort of stare at it for a moment and say, well, I don't quite see where you're going with this, but all right, that's a reasonable rule. You're willing to give at the time of day and understand it while I go on and show some more rules or some more explanation that makes it clear where I'm going with this and what this type is meant to mean. It's not, so it's not clear from this rule what this new type T I'm introducing is meant to mean, but it is a basically reasonable rule. What about this rule? So here's another one where, all right, so P is a type defined for uh, natural numbers X. And then when you've got that, this rule says you've got some term of type P with reflexivity of zero in for X. And now this rule, I think if I show you this and say, here's this grand new type former I've got, you're not going to like hear me out and wait for the next draw. You're going to say, hang on, there's a typo there or something. There's something wrong because X is supposed to be a natural number in P. You're not supposed to be able to put a term of identity type in for it. Um, so when you're reading rules, you're doing some kind of checking that they're reasonable. And one of the bits of checking that they're reasonable that you're doing that we're seeing in this one. Can you see, by the way, where I'm highlighting bits of text in the slides? Does that come through on the share or not? Good. Yep, that works. So uh, one of the things you're doing is essentially you're trying to type check various bits of the syntax that appears in the rules. You're trying to type check this P with a refl zero substituted for X, and you're saying, no, that doesn't type check. X was supposed to be a natural number, not a term of identity type. Here's another one. What about this one? This is, let's see, so it's saying if you've got a term A of some type Q with zero substituted for X and refl zero substituted for Y. This isn't as obviously wrong as the previous one was, but this just doesn't have enough information that you look at this and you say, hang on, what is Q? I guess Q is supposed to be some type family parameterized over a natural number and some term of identity type, but over what identity type? That here, this one also isn't a very good rule because the Q, it's not, on the one hand, it's not introduced. Nothing, there's no premise that tells us what Q was supposed to be. What, what was it parameterized over? And on the other hand, that would be not so bad if there was, if the way we were using Q let us sort of infer somehow it was supposed to be. But in this case, it, it seems like we can't do that either. We can't easily infer what Q was parameterized over. So that's another of the kind of ways we can be unhappy. And here's another one. Let's say we had a rule that says, okay, take when you've got a Boolean A and you've got some type A of identity type parameterized over a natural number, what? it's introducing the same premise of two different types. And that also is something that we never do in practice. And if someone tries to do it, we would complain. We would be unhappy. We'd ask them to stop and fix something or at least explain themselves very carefully. And so these are, there's all of these things which we're doing in our minds when we present a type theory and when we read a type theory, and that we never explicitly say what they are. That there are some things that we explicitly say, sort of, this is like what these are, how the contexts must be well formed and so on. But there's a lot of these criteria that we never explicitly say all rules must follow this because we just we're always writing down a sort of this half dozen rules at this point or another half a dozen rules for another bunch of constructors another time. Um, we always, when we're an author, we make sure that we're following these conventions, these reasonable principles for how well-behaved rules should look. And when we're a reader, we're implicitly checking those in how we understand the rules, how we read them and make sense of them. But because we're never sort of saying generally, what is a rule and what must it be, we never explicitly formulate these kind of conditions. And so the motivation for all this work is that it's part of this uh, thing, which is the, the main thing of this project with Andre and Philip, 
and that also other people have worked on recently, including two others who'll be speaking on closely related topics in this conference, uh, Valerie Saif and Teichu Amura later in the week, um, on trying to set out a general definition of a type theory that is supposed to generalize the kind of type theories that we have read and presented, and that there's a lot of literature on individual ones, trying to generalize those definitions so that it both articulates the unsaid and the standard ones, lets us generalize the theorems and constructions based on them. And so the goal, the main thing I want to talk about today is this issue of look at what specifically the rules are and what they must follow when we, pre when we present them traditionally. What is it that's in our mind when we write, when we read, that, that we're being careful about? Um, so, and so, right, so the outline for today is that first, um, I'll have to start with some background setup, which is to say the rules that, um, the rules that I had on the previous page, to write them down, I had to have some notions of sort of what the raw syntax of expressions were, and some notion of what the kind of rules are that, that can even be good or bad. I mean, the good or goodness or badness will be properties of something. So the background I'll set up will be what are the sort of notions of syntax and rules that we're talking about, and also some of the good properties that we are talking about that one checks were to do with type checking certain things. So we need to have an ambient notion of the type theories that we're type checking them over. Um, so we'll bring in yeah, type theories and derivative judgments. Over those, that will allow us to formulate what are these desirable properties of rules and why are they desirable. Um, then we'll get on towards the end of the um, a subtle aspect of what's going on, which is well-orderedness of the presentations, which I'll say a little more about in a moment. And finally, depending on how time is going, I may say a little about semantics. And so that's the outline and the key goals that we'll be aiming to at the end. Um, are that firstly, as I said, we're trying to articulate what we have in mind in presenting type theories. In particular, having done that, what that will allow us to do is to, to articulate formally the idea that and this, I think, is maybe the a sort of something that most people would accept as what's behind the idea of what a good uh, a type theory should look like, but which is which needs a lot of details filling in, which is a type theory is some family of rules, and they're presented in some order, uh, generally well-ordered, and each rule should be well-formed. It should be a rule that when you read it, it makes sense over the type theory earlier rules by the rules so far. You give the pi type rule, formation rule, then you give the lambda abstraction rule, and each one you check using the others, and you go on happy with the theory. And finally, the other motivation that's a sort of, again, a guiding thing behind the principles we're using is that this should, um, we should be trying to isolate the principles which will suffice in order to give a good, well behaved algebraic semantics to the theory that we're doing, and also good syntactic behavior. We should be able to prove the standard meta theorems about a type theory built up in this kind of way. So starting with some boring stuff, but to fix the terminology that we'll need later on, by syntactic classes, I just mean types and terms. So I'm not, so this is, we're already seeing we're restricting ourselves a bit essentially to theories that are pretty much the shape of Martin Luff uh, dependent type theory, same syntactic classes of types and terms, same judgment forms. And so I should say this is not as general as what Taiichi will, I think, be presenting later in the week, um, which, right, which, it, which covers a lot more type theories. This covers ones which are fitting into the same judgment forms as Martin Leff type theory. By an arity, I mean, and as the example will make this clear in a moment, a list of pairs of a syntactic class and a number. And then a signature is a set of symbols and for each symbol it has a class and an arity. So the idea is each signature um, the, each symbol of the signature, so pi, for instance, uh, if you can highlight it down here, its output is pi. It's a type forming symbol when you, when you have the signature for pi types. Pi is a type former. And then what's its arity? What are its inputs? Its inputs, it has two inputs. Both of them are types. We saw the rule for pi types a few slides back. A pi type takes a type A, and there's nothing bound in A, so that's at first pi zero here. And then its second argument is another type B that binds one variable. And so the arity for pi as a whole is one type argument that binds nothing, one type argument that binds one variable. Similarly, let's look at app, skip over lambda for a minute. 
app is a term constructor that again, it has four arguments now when it's fully annotated as we were earlier. Um, it's a type argument, another type argument that binds something and then two term arguments that don't bind anything. And so this, having looked at these examples, this is what we have in mind when you say that an arity is pairs of syntactic classes and numbers. And so this is, this is clearly a reasonably well-behaved um, abstraction of what the raw syntax is built, out, built up out of. And so over a signature of this form, we have, we can build up the raw expressions. They're scoped, I should emphasize, in that the, um, we don't just think of one set of expressions that can use any variables. Um, we scope them according to what an expression can be in up to n variables. It can refer to, um, if we're de Brown indices or name variables or whatever you prefer, that's something I'll sweep on the Phillips rug. Um, so the, we have the sets of type in term expressions. We can build up raw context from that as suitable lists of raw type expressions. And then we have the notion of judgment forms and judgments over these, which again, a judgment, we have the four standard forms of Martin Love type theory, types, terms, and judgmental qualities between them. And that for instance, a term, a term judgment says, on the one hand, you've got a raw context gamma, um, you've got some raw type expression A, little a, and then you've got some raw type expression big A. And so all of that together is what goes into a term judgment. Again, I should emphasize everything is raw so far. We haven't mentioned type checking or derivability. So these are just raw expressions that are well scoped, but not necessarily well formed. Um, and this is why, I, why I'll keep re repeating the word raw a lot. Um, and we'll, just as terminology, we'll call the uh, equality judgments is what you would expect us to mean by equality judgments. And then others don't have a terribly established name. We call them object judgments, and we'll need to refer to that a few times. And so this is now enough of a setting to write down, uh, to say, to start talking about what we're meaning when we write down a rule. What is a rule? And a rule is, we've all seen lots of them. It's something that you write down and it's, you write down the premises, which is a list of judgments. And then you write down a conclusion based on those. And then having written that down, it's interpreted as a closure condition on derivability that this judgment, this rule for app, which has four premises and one conclusion, we, are, we write it down like what's on the left here. And then when a student who's reading met type, meeting type theory for the first time says, hang on, what does that mean? I mean a student or a mathematician from outside logic also very frequently, we say, oh, okay, it's, it's an abbreviation, it's a notation that means for every actual raw context, gamma and expressions A, B and F, if all these judgments on top are derivable, then that judgment at the end is derivable. So there's this distinction between the specification of the rule as we write it down and its interpretation that we always have, that we already have at this stage. So let's see, and so let, to try and make precise what's going on in the specification, there's several things we need to account for. First, one minor tweak I'll make is that, for now I'll just say it's not necessarily a list of judgments, it could be a family of judgments. At the level of generality for now, we could have infinitary rules as well, or unordered premises. Um, later we will come back and put an order on them, but for now it could just be an arbitrary family of premises. Then, let's see, so the one thing we often insist on, on rules, is that all rules should hold over arbitrary ambient context gamma. And often by abuse of notation, people say, all rules hold over a context gamma, and so we don't bother to write down the gamma. But really, this abuse of notation is, it's, it's not an abuse of notation. It's part of this distinction between the specification of rule, the rule and its interpretation, that if all rules hold over arbitrary contexts, then the context isn't part of the specification. You don't need to write it there. It's that the rule is written without an ambient context, and its interpretation is in the ambient context. What's the next thing we need to treat? The next thing is that rules have these meta variables here that they quantify over, that we're, we're saying for every a, b, and f, and little a, and how are those treated? There are various ways that, I mean, again, when you're, when you're doing the specific case, you just explain what it, what the notation elaborates to as the right hand side. But when we're saying how we specify it, we're trying um, to specify Peter, it as some, uh, yes? Are you by any chance using a virtual 
background because um, yes, there are some glitches in audio and uh, video, and these are usually associated with using a virtual background. If ah. if possible, depending on what's yep. behind you, actually, if possible, if you could disable virtual background, that be right. if it's, yes. If it's if it's making it too glitchy, then I will disable it. It's less photogenic, and it's just a kitchen door. Um, but if it's glitching the audio, then absolutely, I'll um, take a test. Oh, thank you. Uh, right. Oh, okay. No, that's that's much better than uh, Good. my worst nightmare expected. Great. Good. Um, but now somehow we have. Uh, I know if everyone else is experiencing that, but I can see half of your slide. Oh, I can see the whole slide. Perfect. Good. Okay. Thanks. Right. So, yes. so go ahead. Um, so yes. Yeah, so if we're saying that every context, I mean rules holder every context, then the context doesn't need to be included in the specification. But right, sorry, yes, meta variables was the next thing we wanted to take, which was that we want the rule to be a single syntactic object that we write down and can talk about. And so for that, um, these meta variables aren't yet part of that. How should we treat that? We treat it by adding symbols to the signature and saying that these meta variables are those, so just altering the font of them to kind of make clear that um, the distinction here. In a specification, we just add extra type, we add an extra type constructor A and an extra type constructor B and F and A. So we write the rule over an extended signature with new symbols and meta variables. And the last thing is that we have substitution in meta variables that often occurs, like we see in the conclusion of the app rule. That was why I chose this instead of a simpler one like pi. That again, how should we do it? Do we want to always put explicit substitution into the theory? We don't need to do that. We simply write them as arguments to the symbols. And this again is something that is often done, written in practice, and apologized for as an abuse of notation. But it's not an abuse of notation before, at all. It's a perfectly precise thing we can do that then we say in the specification, where we say, ah, oh, right, and I should, here this should say b of x, where we introduce b. Um, we say the fact that B is binding a variable, we introduce it as a symbol that takes an argument, and we apply it to that argument here. And then in, in the interpretation of the rule, that, that argument gets instantiated as a substitution into the meta variable, but it's segregated into the difference between the specification and the interpretation. So here, the interpretation on the right hasn't changed throughout. It's exactly what it said, it should, it said it should be all along. And the one on the left now is, on the one hand, it's actually, it is a form that one could see in a standard write-up with several of abuses of notation, except that now they have been precisely accounted for. And it's also now, it's a single syntactic object. It's, it's precisely a family of judgments over an extension of the signature with some meta-variable symbols. Um, so it's a precise object in the setup that we can now talk about and discuss. So saying that precisely, we have the idea of a meta-variable extension of a signature a raw rule being a family of judgments of premises and one more judgment for the conclusion over the meta variable extension. And an instantiation is picking a context and suitable actual expressions to instantiate those symbol as. And having done that, we get a raw type theory is then just any collection of such rules, um, any collection of raw rules. And this is now enough to define a derivability relation, which is the relation on judgments inductively defined by closure conditions for. On the one hand, we put in the standard structural rules. We always just throw those in as part of the fixed background. I won't write those out uh, for the sake of time, but well, they're all very standard ones. And on the other hand, all of the raw rules that are in this type theory itself, each instantiation of those gives a closure condition that's part of the inductive definition of derivability over the type theory. So this now gives us a fairly straightforward, I think uncontroversial, I hope, setting in which we can talk about rules and derivability over them in order to analyze what properties of the rules we're looking for. So we've defined these. And then also, why couldn't we stop here? Exactly because of the sort of rules that I wrote down on the second slide, where, um, where the rules I wrote down on the second slide, they were all rules, or can, they can all be written down as, with slight changes in notation, rules in the precise sense that we've defined here over some signature, but they were bad ones. And the problem with having bad rules like that, I mean, the reason that we have this sort of 
we, we stand on principle. It's not just because we have sort of high philosophical principles, although it's that too. Um, it's because there are several practical things we want from it. But firstly, maybe I put these in the wrong order here. Firstly, we want to be able to just understand the rules and read them and make sense of them. And for the sort of badly behaved rules, they're simply hard to understand. It's very hard to make sense of what they're saying. Secondly, we want well behavedness as a formal system that various meta theorems that are taken for granted and usually sort of noted and are very standard and straightforward to prove for specific cases, we want those meta theorems to hold. And finally, we want to be able to assign a meaningful and well behaved and tractable semantics to our type theories. So these are why we'll be adding more requirements. So the first requirement is probably the most that I'll talk about is probably the most important one, which is this thing that we type check bits of the rules. And so here to bring in a bit of terminology, presuppositions and boundaries of judgment. So any judgment has some presuppositions, and this terminology goes back to sort of Martin Lerf introducing the type theory and saying, when we read, this is a type, sorry, this is a term of that type, it presupposes that this type is indeed a well-formed type itself. And similarly, when we assert an equality between two types, we are presupposing that both of those types um, are themselves are actual types. And formally, this is simply that to any judgment is associated some family of judgments, which we call its presuppositions, defined by cases on the form of the judgment. A judgment boundary is then something that's very similar to the presuppositions of it. A boundary is, it's like a judgment, except we haven't given the head of it yet. So the boundary of a term judgment, for instance, is saying, we'll give a term of such and such a type, but we haven't yet said what the term is. The boundary of an equality judgment, it includes all the same data as the, as, uh, the same data as the equality judgment. It's saying we've got two types over this context that we're going to think about whether we assert them equal or not, but we haven't asserted them equal yet. Um, and overall, the boundary, it's holding the same data as the propositions. It's just that it's still grouped together into a single configuration, not sort of pulled apart as a family of judgments here. And the helpful analogy here is, let's say, a simplex. Um, that a simplex has a bunch of faces it's, that, and then it's got a single boundary where the boundary is all of its faces organized into a coherent configuration seen as one thing. So the, the boundary has the same information as the presuppositions together, but it's formally a different thing that's useful to talk about in its own right. Boundaries aren't for now, we'll come back to, we'll be using those later, but the Presuppositions are what I want to mention for the first of the good properties we'll discuss, which is that the thing we type check in a rule, when we read a rule and are uh, checking that the expressions involved in it all make sense, what we are type checking precisely is the presuppositions of the various bits of it. Um, we don't type check the sort of the things that are introduced by the premises because the premises are exactly postulating them. You don't expect to be able to derive those, they're being postulated. But we do expect that, for instance, in the conclusion of the app rule, um, or let's say you know, the conclusion of the lambda rule, we give the lambda of a type pi type. We do expect that then that pi type is something that's well formed using the pi rule that we already saw. And precisely we can say that a raw rule is derivably presuppositive, which is a strong sense, if all the presuppositions of its premises and conclusion are derivable from the premises over some ambient background type theory that since you're never working in isolation, you're often needing to refer to other rules. And then often you have a slightly weaker thing, which is, uh, or various slightly weaker things, which uh, right, I won't, right, I'll not say it in detail for the sake of time. So the slightly weaker conditions of the admissible presuppositivity, um, that the presuppositions should all be well typed based on something that you can see from the premises, that's essentially never violated in practice. I don't, when I say never here, I mean, I can't think of any type theory I've ever read where someone deliberately violated that principle, wrote down a rule where there were ill-typed types involved or something. Derivable presuppos presuppositivity, that is sometimes violated. That doesn't always hold. Um, because often people omit certain premises of a rule, like you might omit in the rule for app or lambda, you might omit the A and B types that we start premises from the start, because you can infer that those hold 
from the later things, either as presuppositions of them or as inversion principles or something. So derived from trace positive doesn't always hold, but without loss of sort of natural generality, um, all rules that, that occur in nature, you can put in the missing premises, that's the premises that were sort of implicitly inferred, um, and then you get something that's derivably presuppositive and you don't lose any natural examples that way, you get equivalent rules. And there's a kind of nice well-behavedness property we get from that. If all the rules of a theory are presuppositive, then whenever you can derive a judgment of it over that theory, then you can derive all the presuppositions of that judgment as well. This is sort of, it's not an especially kind of powerful principle, but it's a sort of reasonableness that one wants to hold for any tight theory. Um, and so yes, this is, this is, this is, I think, the principle that is sort of most strictly held to in all presentations of type theories that I know. I'd be very interested to know if anyone has an example that deliberately breaks this principle. Um, another property that comes up that I want to look a little at is this, is what we might call tightness. I mean, we call it tightness, it's not a terribly good name, we haven't found a better name, um, which is that it's exactly getting into this issue we looked at a moment ago of saying, do you explicitly introduce all the premises of a rule? So in the second formulation of the pi type rule that we have here, um, we haven't explicitly said A is a type, but you can infer that it's a type because it was used in the context of the premise B. So um, on the other hand, you have this formulation of the rule, which I gave at the beginning, where you explicitly spell out what all the premises were, all the meta variables were. And we use tightness for this property that the meta variables correspond precisely to the object judgment premises, and each premise introduces the corresponding meta variable. And, um, and this, this principle, you often, as in this example of the second form of pi types, you very often do want to leave this principle aside. It's not such a dreadfully important principle. But we only violate fairly strict limitations again that the missing premises can essentially think that I can think of. They can always be inferred via things like presuppositions or inversion principles, like the fact that A as a type could be inferred from its use in the context extension here. And that it loses that it loses no natural examples to say all rules should be tight in this sense. An example of a rule that that violates the principle more severely is this uh, yeah, selections not working very cleanly. Uh, um, this third one I've got here, where we try to introduce the same meta variable twice with two different typings. That's a kind of another violation of this principle of the sort that you don't find generally in nature. That, that people don't do this and would, I think, one complains, it's hard to make sense of a thing like this. Um, Peter? And see. So, yep. Andre, on the has previous a slide? Yep. Can you tell us what the pi rule should actually look like? So it should be b of x probably in the second premise? Uh, yes. So the second premise again should be b of x. Sorry, and a, then yeah. the conclusion should somehow indicate that x is bound somewhere? Uh, no, the conclusion doesn't have to indicate that X is bound. Ah, okay, so that's the way um, you're doing it. Okay, yep. Right, so the argument, right, the argument here simply is a type in an extension, a certain extension of the ambient context by one variable. Okay. Right. The binding is encoded in the background arity of the pi and the signature, which we said, in, thank you, one binds one variable. Yeah. Um, right. And as with presuppositivity, we bump this up from individual rules to theories. We say that a theory is tight if all its rules are tight and its object judgment rules correspond precisely to its symbols of the signature. So we've got the tightness both at the level of the premises of the rule and the rules of the type theory. And we, we can, um, again, this gives us useful properties like that we get a uniqueness of typing principle from it, uh, which I'll skip over the details of just for the sake of getting on a bit. And the next couple of uh, principles, substitute, substitutivity and congruity, I think I'll skip over those as well. They're ones I don't want to say so much about. Um, even skipped over them while I was making the slide. Um, there are another couple of principles that are a bit more negotiable, a bit less crucial than the others, but are useful to have around for being able to discuss what properties of the theory imply what properties of the resulting drivability system. 
and in the chat, Mike Shulman says, but if one, uh, but if one using is using name uh, variables, then the syntax should indicate somehow that the variable that's being bound in dx is uh, x rather than y or z, shouldn't it? <laughs> yes, I, I will. I will. Right. Sorry. Let me. If if Michael forgive me, I will leave aside for now the question of different treatments of variables. For now, let's consider it as the brown indices are our, our, our treatment of variables. And right. we're very open to the idea of other treatments of variables, but for the sake of today and keeping sorry, keeping what we can fit in today, I won't go into those. But yes, that's, that's a good thing to be able to think of as, no, it's a variant one wants to think of as well, absolutely. Um, there isn't time to think of it right now. Um, so the major ingredient that we haven't mentioned yet that's implicitly there, and again, never explicitly talked about, but I think very much implicitly there, you can see its footprints in many things you do, is that presentations come in an order that, at several steps, um, the types in a context are ordered, the premises of a rule are ordered, and the rules of a theory are ordered. And, I mean, maybe they're only ordered because we write them down on paper, and the way we write down on paper is ordered. But, not really. There's, there's something more going on in the ordering than just we had to choose a random order to write them on paper. The, the, um, when we're type checking things, we're checking that the uh, expressions are meaningful. Typically the raw expressions in each type or premise or rule, they use only the earlier variables or the meta variables introduced by earlier premises or the constructors introduced earlier in the type theory. So the lambda rule, the rule for lambda, it makes use of pi, but it doesn't make use of beta reduction or something. In the state of type checking as well, that type checking each component uses only the previously introduced uh, rules. So right, when, when we're writing down the rule for lambda, it may make use of the rule for formation of pi types, but it doesn't make use of beta reduction or anything. Um, and again, in almost all, here I do have to put in the almost, almost all type theories one meets in nature, there is naturally um, such an ordering on the rules. And this ordering, it's taken advantage of uh, implicitly in, for instance, the way we structure proofs, that if I was giving some proof of something about type theory with pi types and sigma types or, or whatever, um, let's say I'm describing the semantics of it, if I tried to give you the semantics of lambda abstraction, before having told you the semantics of pi types, you'd probably say, hang on, hang on, wait, what were the semantics of pi type first? Then I tell you what the, the pi type is. And then having done that, lambda abstraction is supposed to give some term of that type. So we can do the semantics for lambda after we've done the semantics for pi, but not before. And similarly, we can't do beta reduction semantics. We can't check that until we've said what were the interpretation of the lambda and application already. So there's an order in there. Um, and uh, so how do we put this ordering in? And this is where it gets a little subtle. So let's look at it for contexts first, which is this, because contexts are, they're not, so rules and theories are a closed class. So if you write down one theory and study one theory. Um, contexts are an, an open class where you, for any theory, you define what all its contexts are precisely. So um, that's the place where we do have people really do say what the order, how the ordering comes in. And that's by having the context judgment, the uh, well, several ways, but the most common way probably is by having a context judgment that you say the empty context is always well formed and a context extension is well formed. And that defines an inductive judgment on contexts, which may be mutual with the other judgment forms or separate depending on how you prefer to present it. So, so for context, it's clear enough what they are. Let's see, for rules, for rules, we'll do something similar, but it's a bit harder to say now because the things involved are more complex. So we'll look at rules again. Let's restrict ourselves for now to, to finite tree rules, which we didn't before, but for now to finite tree rules and to ones whose premises are simply sequentially presented, given in some ordered list, natural number ordered list. But the, so what is a reasonable premise family for a signature? the empty premise family certainly is reasonable family of premises. And then if you've got some premise family, what do you add to it? You add in for the next premise, what you extend it by a judgment boundary. 
And this you may sort of furry your brow for a moment, and I'll look at an example on the next slide. Um, whether we want to give a judgment boundary that should be reasonable and well formed over the ambient theory plus the earlier introduced premises. And if you've got that, we've got some premises, and then we've got another well formed boundary over it, then we can extend by it. And then a rule will be a well formed, a uh, sequentially presented rule will be a sequentially presented premise family like that, together with another boundary for the conclusion. And there's a still, I'm saying boundaries everywhere, not judgments. Why? Because this is to make tightness baked in. That tightness says the object judgment premises, so the premises that should have heads, should be exactly introducing the meta variables that they correspond to. And so if, we're, if we know what the heads are supposed to be, we don't have to specify them. We leave them out and fill them in afterwards. So we're going to, just, what one provides is just a boundary, and then one fills in the head as the corresponding meta variable. And similarly, the conclusion, we're going to fill in its head later when we build it into a type theory by putting in whatever symbol the rule introduces. And so as an example for the app rule in this setting, seeing how this comes as a sequentially presented rule, the first one, it's saying A is a type, or blank is a type, because it's not called A yet. It's over nothing at all. It doesn't you don't need to do anything to see that the presuppositions of that are reasonable. This, to see that that's all reasonable, you, you, you look at the fact that you already had A, that convinces us this is a reasonable context extension, and so now we put this in, and then its head will get filled in as being B of X. Then similarly, F, we can, type, we can check that its presuppositions are well formed by, yes, this is the pi rule applied to the earlier premises A and B, and then we can fill F in there, and similarly for the A and the conclusion. So this is the, what I mean by the headlessness and the filling in the premises afterwards to ensure that tightness for both the rule and the theory is baked in the whole way. And so finally putting this together, um, and I see Chris has his eye on the clock, um, we're getting to the, um, We've got the ingredients now to put it together at the level of whole type theories. And now there's a couple of different options, of which one is a bit cleaner to define, and the other is a little more natural in general. Both work well, so I'll give them both. So the first is following what we had before for the rules and the contexts, and just sort of bumping it up, except that unlike with the rules and the contexts, with type theories, we really naturally do want to be able to consider type theories with infinitely many rules. There are lots of type theories that, when you look at them closely, it's so they've got a sort of scheme of rules, which is actually formally infinitely many rules. And so we really do need to let them be infinite. So we do something like what we did before. We say the empty theory is linearly well presented. You can extend by one more well-formed rule in the sense we just defined a sequentially presented headless rule, let's say, and then that's a well-presented, linearly well-presented type theory. And if you've got a limit ordinal, then if you've got an increasing chain of theories built up according to the limit ordinal, then take their union, and that again is a linearly well-presented type theory. And actually, we don't really need the first case as a special case because it follows from the third example. So long as you're not a traditional set theorist too much, you believe that zero is a limit ordinal. Um, and this actually, right, I wrote it down and it sort of, it looks reasonable. And if you stop and think about it, there are, there are two different ways to read it. It's a bit ambiguous, but they're equivalent. You can either read it as, an inductive recursive type of linearly well-presented theories where we're saying here are two constructors for linearly well-presented theories together with implicitly a way to flatten one into a raw type theory that then lets us talk about having well-presented well-formed rules over it. So here, here was where we are doing that, that T is a well-presented type theory Implicitly, we're now flattening it, in, flattening it into a raw type theory so that we can talk about derivability over it. Or we could just read this as a predicate on raw type theories. We're saying what it means to give a presentation of a raw, of a raw type theory of a certain sort. Um, and these two are equivalent. It's a standard way of unwinding certain inductive recursive types into uh, inductive families. One thing which this, this may look familiar to those of you who've read Tei Hu Uemura's uh, defini uh, definition of general type theories, which will be coming later in the week, he uses something very similar this, for this to present signatures. And so this is, I think, the cleanest definition we have of uh, well-presented type theory. 
and it's it's general enough to work very well uh, and work very nicely. But it just it has slight shortcomings, not awfully important ones, but ones that are a little unsatisfactory, which is that firstly, in many specific examples, the ordering isn't naturally total. Um, that for instance, if I have the theory of sigma types and pi types, we had, as we talked about, ordering within the groups of sigma and pi types, but there's no particular ordering between those two that I might present the theory with the pi types written down first before the sigma types, but when I give the semantics, I give the sigma type semantics first before the pi types. You wouldn't complain about that, I hope. Um, that's a, there's no implicit order between those two. And so it's just, the order isn't naturally total, why do we need to make it total? And on the other hand, constructively, when you look at uh, order, well-founded orderings beyond the finite, it's not without loss of generality that you, can, you can't necessarily convert any, any well-founded order into a total one. So, so especially from a constructive viewpoint, we want to allow our well-founded order to be partial. Um, and so, so we can do it over a partial well order, but we'll have to be a little more careful of how one says it. So a well-presented type theory over a partial order, we can say it's a well-ordering in the uh, constructive, not necessarily total sense of just a well-founded relation. Um, and then a family of triples where we have to split up the raw and the, the sort of the arity, the raw part and the type checked part of the rule in order to be able to say that each rule is, uses only the earlier parts of the signature and is type checkable over the earlier parts of the theory. And I won't go through the details for the sake of pushing on uh, as we're full of time, but they're here um, if anyone wants to sort of ask about them in the questions. So, so it's, it's taking what we just had on the last slide and then saying it a bit more carefully, a bit more refinedly for the sake of making it partial. Um, and the final thing we can say about these is that these type theories do enjoy all of the good properties we discussed before. And so summing this up, we have four notions of type theory that we've looked at. Raw type theories, which are very elementary, and I think they're certainly part of what's going on in our head when we write down type theories traditionally. Um, they're very general, and so they're not necessarily nice, so they're not really everything that's going on in our head when we think of what a type theory is, but we need them. We can't say, yeah, they're a bad notion, we shouldn't have defined those, because all of the other notions we're giving use these as an auxiliary notion to build up what the well-presented ones are. Um, then, then we can add the niceness properties onto the raw type theory, and that makes them a lot better in some ways, but still, until we add some order, the semantics are a bit unclear. Um, it's hard to, I, I haven't looked at that, and I think given the time I won't try to, but if you had in mind how one would translate the rules into, um, say, the standard, the translation to algebraic semantics in terms of categories of attributes or families or whatever you prefer, um, one is using the ordering on, on the rules to set this and on the theory to define that. The linearly well-presented type theory is, is then a very nice, pretty clear definition that both it's, it's sufficient for the strong niceness properties and the good semantics. On the other hand, it's adding something in that, at least arguably, isn't necessarily part of what we had in mind when we originally kind of wrote down the type theory. It's not part of what we were checking or respecting. And then the general well-presented type theories over a partial order, a well-founded relation, uh, the definition is a bit harder to formulate and, as, and especially to formulate sort of cleanly, but it does now, I think it enjoys the, the again, the strong niceness properties, the good algebraic semantics it suffices for. Um, and this, I think most closely reflects what we have in, in our mind, what we're checking when we read through a type theory, we're checking that a presentation is something of this form. And I think rather than trying to dabble through the semantics in three minutes, I'll end there and say thank you very much. All right, uh, well, thank you very much. So we're gonna do silent applause, meaning we applaud, but only uh, video, no audio, because that messes up everyone's microphone. So please join me in thanking Peter for this great talk. And um, we're gonna have, uh, we have about nine minutes for discussion. Uh, Questions, comments, insults. Um, uh, All welcome. So uh, feel free to unmute your microphone and ask the question. 
or choose the other, one of the other two options. I'll ask a question, Peter. Um, the, the last two seem to differ if you're having some kind of type theory with infinitely many rules. Are there good examples of, of that? Uh, yes. So um, one example is that when you look at the identity types with the Frobenius condition, um, hang on, sorry, no, this is, no, sorry, uh, that was an example for the, for the wrong thing that I had in mind. Um, right, so the last two, the, the well presented with a linear order versus the well presented with a uh, possibly partial order, those, they don't differ too much in that, at least classically, and also with the sort of specific ones that we tend to use, any well-founded partial order can be extended to a well-founded linear order. Um, so any, any one of these partial ones, you can just linearize it and put it in. But the linearization, the sort of totality of the order, it just sort of it isn't naturally there in when you look at, for instance, how people are using. So again, the, the example I had of if you have a theory with, with pi types and sigma types, um, and then look at how constructions and proofs based on those are done, they always, essentially always will respect the partial order that there was between the, rule, the rules within the pi type group and within the sigma type group, but they very often won't reflect any particular total order between the pi types and the sigma types. They could be written down as pi types first in the presentation and then something proved later with the sigma types first. Um, so right, so the sort of the total order, the totality of the order, it isn't naturally there, but at least classically, it doesn't lose any generality. Okay, thanks. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, I'll try something. Yep. Hello. So I was uh, looking forward to the semantics. Um, so, um, uh, so this will be semantics of of your syntax rather than rather than Cartesian closed categories for the, for the lambda types or anything like that. Um, and I'm thinking. Um, well, firstly, um, you will have internal languages in your semantics in the same sense as we talk about internal groups, except that mm -hmm. this is not the sense in which people use the phrase internal language. Um, so maybe this is the time for, for to drop the term internal language and replace it by something else. Um, now, a, a simpler example of the, of the, um, of the uh, semantics. Uh, so I tried doing this in my book with the um, no pi simplers, just the algebraic part, trying to have some equivalence between categories with classes of this lane maps, I should say, classes closed under pullbacks, um, and some algebraic syntax. And I got stuck. You will find a footnote in, in my book saying, I can't do this. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, possibly not at the top of your agenda, to know what the, what the semantics of this um, might end up being. So, right, so the semantics of these that uh, we have looked at are the ones that um, are based on categories with families or categories with attributes or contextual categories or any of the combinations of these when we meet. Or categories um, with display maps, try that one. Absolutely, yes, yes, if you prefer, yep, absolutely. There are these various ones which one can go between them and each presentation has sort of something that they do slightly more nicely or not. And as you said, the semantics we're considering are this sort of very off the sh this sort of automatic uniform translation of the type theory, not the sort of nicer tailor-made ones for a specific type theory like Cartesian closed categories or anything like that. Yeah. Um, going to get to where you mentioned internal languages, by the way, I guess my feeling there is that we don't, we don't need to, there's, there's no reason to retire the term, but we, ha, we sort of should be more honest that it's an ambiguous term, that it's like talking of the theory of a structure. The theory of a structure depends on what language you're considering the structure as a structure for. That you can, you can talk about the theory of some structure in full first order logic or algebraic logic or with some different basic relations. 
and so the theory of a structure is not as well defined a term as one makes it sound like until it's specified. An internal language is just a very similar thing like that is but right, sorry, that, that that was sort of a digression. I just wanted to reply to that bit of your question. But right, the semantics that we've looked at here is a sort of very uniform one for these type theories um, that one can give. Is the off-the-shelf translation um, based on categories with families um, or contextual categories, etc. And there, it's built up here by taking the well-founded presentations. If they're linear, we can see it as a cell complex and as rule extensions. If they're partial well-founded relations, we can see them as the sort of partial analogs of cell complexes, which are the, have been studied by Luria's good co-limits or by Makai Rositsky, uh, the fat small object argument. So I call these things fat cell complexes. Um, and then by inducting over those, one can mirror the rule extensions on the syntactic side into an analogous rule extensions, building up an algebraic theory on the semantic side. Um, and then the, right, and then one gets this, and then the standard semantics for the specific theories is precisely recovered. And so yes, I think that's, the, you had several okay. big questions in your question. I think I've replied to several of them, and I've also then sort of done what I said I wouldn't and gabbled through the semantics in two or three minutes. I think uh, we have uh, another question from Martin Highland, but before that, I'm just going to say that just as internal language is a uh, is an ambiguous term. Taylor made when you speak to Paul Taylor is also an ambiguous term. Anyway, oh, I'll hand pro it over. Proper to language Martin. is my substitution for it. So, Peter, um, I'd like to pose a question of the following form. Supposing you're thinking about essentially algebraic theories, mm -hmm. right? I mean, then you have a way to explain essentially algebraic theories in which you make an algebraic extension of something, and then you've got some definable stuff. Yeah. And so you make an algebraic extension over that, and so on, and so on, and so on. In exactly the same way as what's happening in the talk you've given. Now, do you regard those that as essentially the same phenomenon? Can it be? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. I think this, yeah, that if sort of a wreck, that that's an analogy that I kind of very much considered putting in and would have if there'd been more space on this bit of the topic, that it's a phenomenon that doesn't show up in, for instance, first order logic or algebraic theories, that they have the sort of clear stratification in first order logic, you give first your signature and then your propositions and then your axioms. And they all respect this stratification nicely. Whereas you have this phenomenon that shows up in the type theories and then the, the, well, the one, essentially the first place I know it shows up, the one place that's simpler than this that it really shows up in logic is exactly essentially algebraic theories where when you add a new constructor, it then, it increases what equations you can form, so it adds more arities, and so it increases what constructors you then later can add. And so with essentially algebraic theories, if you want to analyze presentations of those, you have the say, you find the same thing that you want to analyze them as something like cell complexes is a very helpful way of analyzing what presentations of essentially algebraic theories look like. Yeah, I think. Right, and then as always with, with anything that sort of has a cell complexity feeling, the tricky thing with setting it up is finding the right ambient category for the cell complexes to live in. And then once you've got the ambient category, so if you may not want all topological spaces, you may, want, you may just want cellularly presented spaces, but you have to have the ambient category and then within there, you can define your cell complexes and then you're good to roll. And that's again, right, the same. Essentially algebraic theories have a very nice ambient category. Here the trouble is, it's a lot harder to find sort of the good ambient category, I think. Um, and so, right. Sorry, so that's sort of why this is diff more difficult to set up in this setting, but it's a very analogous phenomenon. All right. Um, I think we are about to wrap up. I would allow, I, mean, I really enjoy hearing all these British accents. So 
Um, uh, so I would allow one short question maybe, but it needs to be short and the answer needs to be short. Um, and I didn't hear one, so great. Um, I guess uh, we should thank Peter again with silent applause. And uh, uh, we're gonna adjourn for this talk and we're gonna resume at 12. Folks, we'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. Thanks again to the organizer and audience. Thank <laughs> you.